Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kelly Baisley, School and Family Programs Manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. Today, I'm joined by Megan Pyle, Touring Docent. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual, interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, to slow down, discover the joy of looking at art and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Megan will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork, and Megan will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Megan, myself, and each other throughout the hour. Right now, everyone's microphone is muted by default. A couple of tips that we suggest for your experience today is to choose a quiet room, um, close the door and silence any devices that might have alerts. Use headphones and microphone for the best sound quality. Use a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best picture quality and the largest screen to see the images. And make sure your display name is your first name and last name or first name and last initial. Um, to ask questions or make comments during the discussion, you have a few options. You'll be able to unmute your microphone and just chime in when you uh, would like. You can also type into the chat box. We'll try our best to get to those. Um, or you could raise your hand in the participant sidebar and one of us, Megan or I, will call on you um, to unmute your microphone. We are recording today, so if you'd prefer not to be recorded, please leave your audio muted and your uh, video muted and type into the chat box for your questions or comments. Does anyone have any questions before we start? All right, Megan, what will we be talking about today? Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Megan Pyle, and I'm pleased to be a docent and part of the Asheville Art Museum family. Uh, I'm so happy to be with y'all this afternoon and to share a conversation about these artworks. The theme for today is, could your child make this? This is oftentimes a criticism of artworks that may appear to be simplistic, abstract, or primitive. Uh, since becoming a mother, I've become exceedingly captivated by bright, colorful, cheerful, and playful artworks. And generally speaking, I'm just happier, more fun-loving, more optimistic. Uh, motherhood has changed my worldview, to say the least, and that's why I chose this theme. Um, in honor of childhood, I've chosen three artworks that focus on what lies in a child's whimsy and imagination. Um, second, I've chosen three artworks that at a quick, quick glance may evoke the comment, my child could make this. Uh, and lastly, I was inspired by two quotes from one of the artists. Um, and the quotes are, I am for art that grows up not knowing that it is art at all. And everything that I do is completely original. I made it up when I was a kid. So I'm excited about discussing these artworks with y'all. Uh, I will facilitate the conversation for the artworks. And so please feel free to chime in anytime. Uh, we'll discuss each artwork for about 15 minutes. And sometimes we have to cut the conversation short so that we can spend time with each artwork. So, all right, let the wild rumpus start, and uh, let's look at the first artwork, please. All right, um, so if everyone could take um, about 15 seconds to look at this artwork, um, top to bottom, left to right, corner to corner.
Okay, well, what's going on in this artwork? I see a cherry, but although the cherry is large and centered, what my eye is drawn to is to the red dots, the four on the bottom, the two cluster together on the right, and the two on the left. And, and that's what draws my eye into the picture. So you're not, um, so you're, you're drawn um, to the echoes of the dots, um, not the, the main image in the center. Um, um, so, so what else is going on with this? What, what else are you, do you see? I see the black line that sort of defines a three-dimensional shape in that red central piece. Um, just the simplicity and the limit, limited number of colors that are used um, sort of brings a little bit more attention um, for me. And um, what else do you see that makes you say that? I noticed too that the red on the top of the cherry near the stem is like outside the lines. In other words, like it isn't colored in the lines. Um, so um, can you tell me more about the, the color in the lines or outside the lines? It's interesting that there's a light colored spot in the middle of the fruit. Um, so, uh, so how does this artwork make you feel? Kay. Kay has her hand raised. Oh, I was going to say, um, I was drawn by the, the very strong lines, um, really heavy lines uh, in this, I don't know what it is, watercolor, I don't know what it is, but, um, and also really, I think someone said earlier, it's only got one color. Uh, I assume the background is the paper, and so there's really, besides the lines, there's really just the one color. And in the chat, Sally says that the stem is being emphasized and that she says it's a print. Um, and um, so um, can you can you tell me more about the stem? I find the, a lot of energy. Um, in this artwork and to me it feels very fluid and almost like the cherry is bursting um, and it makes me think that it was um, it was executed quickly perhaps it wasn't but um, it has that kind of um, energy uh, to me i agree with kathy i can see motion and movement it, it almost looks like the cherry was like plucked and it, it, it's sort of uh, moving along there. Um, so can you tell me more about the, the movement of the cherry, you know, directionally or, um, or that it's, it's, it's bursting? Um, what do you see about the movement? Well, when I mentioned bursting, um, that was the first thing that, that struck me when I looked at this. It's just that energy. And um, I did go to the red, um, the body of the cherry, and then uh, just the way those lines are uh, executed on the bottom, giving it dimension. Um, it, it feels vibrant and as if it's almost bursting and perhaps those red dots are indicative of a, of a, of biting into a, a juicy cherry. So, um, 
how how do you how does this artwork make you feel? Um, do, would anyone else care to chime in on how how this artwork makes them feel personally? Well, this is funny, but it reminds me of my mom, who's no longer here, because she always would drink gin and tonics with lime and a cherry. And if they brought her the gin and tonic and there was no cherry, she'd send it back. And I see this cherry and in a positive way. And uh, I think of my mom, so. Yeah. So what about a child's whimsy and imagination does this artwork convey? Um, we've touched on the sort of playfulness and the, the movement. Um, and the, the Megan, color. there's a couple comments in the chat about the um, feeling question that you had. And Bet says uh, comfortable, and Sally says energetic and playful. Those are those are those are good. All good comments. Uh, everyone's been making such good good comments. Um, I almost wonder if the dots are to have come out of where the center of the cherry has the white and the dots almost belong there to fill back in the color. Just kind of an interesting mm -hmm. concept. Yeah, I, um, on the dots, the first thing I thought of when I saw the dots were um, spots of blood. So it, it's a little different feeling, I guess, when I looked at it. Hmm. Um. I was wondering what Bet saw that made her say um, comfortable. So what do, what do we see that, what do you see that makes you say that you feel comfortable? She might be typing, <laughs> maybe. Perhaps she doesn't, oh. she's not unmuting. Soft colors. She's <clears throat> typing. Oh, the soft colors. Okay, good. Um, so how do you think this artwork would make a child feel? Like eating the cherry. <laughs> Hungry. Okay, good. So a child um, would, would see a, a sort of a literal interpretation of the cherry, would just see it as an object of food and would want to would wanna feel hungry or would want to reach out and take a bite. Um, Megan Lynn had made a comment that she was paying attention to the two black lines that are not connected to the cherry. So here and here, and said it gives her a sense of the surface on which the cherry is put. Okay, good. Um, and um, can you tell me more about that? Um, can you tell us more about that, about the surface? That the cherry may be placed on, and if that has um, any, and that sort of ha alters the the meaning for you or the the story of this cherry. Well, I think the artist intended it to be um, on something because of those uh, horizontal lines. It felt like uh, the artist may have been creating. Um, a table or a base of some sort. Okay, good. Um, I could almost see this as an illustration in a cookbook for a recipe, maybe for cherry pie or something. Okay, good. Um, and, and seeing a smile, she says the black lines within the red area resemble smile and wink. Okay, so in here, Okay, good. Um, so why do you think that this artwork is in a museum? Well, 
Well, I think because it's um, it's balanced and it's um, very striking and sometimes perhaps uh, simplicity is harder to achieve than um, uh, t than complicated technique. And okay. Sally says partly because of who uh, who made it. And I was thinking maybe the same thing. I, I'm thinking is at the bottom, is it Cy? Is it Cy Twombly? I'm sorry, I'm coming late. You may have already said that. But if it is Cy Twombly, it would make sense because he, he's very famous. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good. Well, um, thank you all for your comments. Um, we'll have to we'll have to end our discussion here. But I will offer if there's anyone else who who has a, a comment that they'd like to make. Um, now would be the time. Sally says in the chat, it could be a study. Okay, good. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, so now um, let's move on to the label. Um, this is, this artwork is, the title is Cherry. It's by Klaus Oldenburg. Um, it's a color woodcut on rice paper. Um, and, and I'll tell you now that um, this is the artist um, with the inspirational quotes. Um, that I am for art that grows up not knowing that it is art at all and everything I do is completely original. I made it up when I was a kid. Um, but this artwork relates to the theme with its simpler subject matter and playful, happy, childlike vibes, uh, which, which I think you all touched upon um, with your comments. Um, and it certainly has evoked emotions um, and memories and um, various various interpretations. Um, but a cherry heralds a time of sweetness, love, and harmony. Cherries are among the first trees to bloom in early spring. Their sweet and fragrant bl blossoms announce a time when sweetness is returning to our lives. Um, in 1931, the song Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries became an inspirational song during the Great Depression that reminded people to enjoy the sweetness of life. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Don't take it serious. It's too mysterious. You work, you save, you worry so, but you can't take your dough when you go, go, go. The sweet things in life to you were just loaned. So how can you lose what you've never owned? Life is just a bowl of cherries. So live and laugh at it all. Um, so I think this is um, an artwork that um, both children and adults um, would appreciate um, if they were to see it hanging in a museum. Um, Klaus Oldenburg uh, was born in 1929. He's a Swedish American pop art sculptor, best known for his giant soft sculptures of everyday objects. His artistic success was due in part to his irreverent humor and incisive social commentary. He took objects from the everyday world, such as typewriters, lipstick, flashlight, and lifted them out of their usual context and forced viewers to reassess their preconceptions about the objects. Um, and pop art is an art movement that emerged in the 1950s and flourished in the 1960s in America and Britain, drawing inspiration from sources in popular and commercial culture. Oldenburg lives and works in New York. Um, so now let's move on to the second artwork. And again, we'll take um, 15 seconds to um, look top to bottom, left to right, and corner to corner.
Um, so, so where is your eye first drawn in this artwork? I'm drawn to the center, to the, um, the red that's kind of cloudy and not clear, that has a little bit of green and a little brown in it there. And it's quite abstract. Um, I'm seeing trees, flowers, maybe even a few people. So what do you see that makes you, you say that? Um. The colors are like jumbled together. There's no defining lines. It's almost like it's like a blur, like just like thrown onto a canvas almost. Um, quite abstract, but I'm intrigued by the different shades of um, the various colors and how they blend together. Um, and so what more can we find about the, the trees and people that, that you see? Um. It makes me think of today because we're right in between summer and fall and you still have the greens and the some of the other colors, but then you have the brighter blue sky of the fall and then starting to have um, the leaves that are changing colors. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yes, the colors for me, um, I'm a real color person and I feel like this is delivering everything. The whole spectrum and um, as uh, someone said, you know, they're drawn to the number of different variations, uh, tints and tones, and uh, so the colors are, are remarkable and beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I see the, the changing colors, uh, the reds, but in different tones and hues, add to depth, give uh, some depth in the um, piece itself. Okay, good. We have a few comments in the chat. Um, Jean is agreeing that her eye is drawn to the red center, but Kathy is drawn to the red squigglies at the top. These ones maybe, or these ones, Kathy? The green uh, squigglies, both the dark uh, one that arcs over and then the lighter color on the top. Up there, okay. Yeah. Um, and then Jean also says that she sees some tree trunks at the bottom, but hadn't thought of trees or people until Laurel mentioned it. Mm -hmm. That the colors give the piece energy. Yeah, I was going to say the to me the brown color was sort of a surprise, a, 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 a pleasant surprise. You know, it gave it a lot of uh, depth and interest. I think as opposed to just traditional flower colors and I also liked um, the fact that the artist it, you know it's not like uh, part of half of it's all red and then the bottom corner is blue the artist took some of the blue and made a little bit of the blue up in the red and then if they look at the very bottom left you can see some red in the blue and that really sort of helped bring the whole composition together for me. Okay, good. So um, what, what do you notice repeating? Um, and are there any patterns created? I see a lot of... Um, Vertical movement, sort of, um, as well as horizontal movements of the green, kind of having horizontal streaks. Almost uh, off to the right, upper right, in the green, it kind of looks like words or letters were being written in green. Um, and I see some, you know, the big horizontal band of the red in the middle. Um, even the white uh, throughout or the lighter colors throughout sort of have 
similar weight and depth, um, chunkiness to them. Um, I don't know if it's white, I can't really tell on my phone, but um, towards the bottom third, um, various spots. It, for, to me, it's very playful and it looks like the artist had fun making it. Okay, good. I see a lot of the yellow coming through. It's almost like if you look at one color, then that color becomes the predominant dominant color and you just see it like everywhere. You can see yellow on the left, on the right, in the middle, on the top. And um, each color has its own color, but yet it also blends to make other colors or other shades of those colors. So I would be interested in knowing from the artist how they started doing this, if they just like started and just kept going, or if there was really a defined plan in mind. Okay, good. Uh, I'm seeing a, somehow this uh, keeps, I keep thinking seasonal. We start out with the green and then red would be fall. The, the little band of black there may be the winter because there's a lot of white in it. And then in the corner there, you have kind of springtime colors. I'm, I'm kind of thinking it's a Rorschach seasonal picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So what about a child's whimsy and imagination does this artwork convey? Well, a child might have um, a hard time staying in the line, so to speak. Uh, you know, in their coloring and such. And so I would think that this would, this would be easy for them to relate to because um, from finger painting to uh, just, uh, hopefully children are still encouraged to just, just paint and do whatever, not just uh, follow a coloring sheet. But I could see a child relating to this because that would be their unstructured approach to, to paint as well. Okay, good. Um, and how does this artwork make you feel? It makes me feel happy. And, um, I could say fun. I mean, it's just a fun piece to look at. I could see the, the, the finger painting aspect, the kind of free, just freedom and, and fun. Okay, good. And how do you think this artwork would make a child feel? I think the same. I think it would make a child happy. Playful. Okay, good. So, so what do you see that, um, or what, what makes you say that? Um, I can imagine being a child or being with a child and watching them experiment by uh, uh, trying different, whatever's in front of them, whatever color it is that uh, is alive in them in the moment. Um, I can see that being a real experiential um, experience. Uh, at least that's what's coming up for me. Yes. Sally says she thinks the um, a child would enjoy the variety of colors, and Jean says the child might enjoy the lack of structure. Okay, good. So what title would you give this artwork? I'm not certain on a title, but I could almost see this as a scarf. This would make a really nice scarf. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, good. So um, is this a, a painting that you would hang in your home? Uh, and if yes, uh, in which room in your house would you hang it? Yes, and I would hang it in my living room. So it'd be the first thing I see when I walk in. I could see this in a music room too, because you could almost sense when you play the music, the notes bouncing around and, uh, yeah. I could see putting it inside my entry. Um, I have a diagonal wall that has, uh, is downlit with a single light and it might be fun to, for me, to, I visualize maybe seeing it someplace where I can get close to it yet stand at a distance but have it well lit so I could really appreciation, appreciate the contrast and colors and the playfulness. It seems like it might go with just about anything. So why do you think this artwork is in a museum? I think too because it looks or you one would think it's easier to make or to do or to achieve than it really is because um, a lot of artists have some plan in mind and this probably is not that easy to uh, replicate if you tried it. Yes, I also had a funny uh, thought when I saw it at first in thinking of a child because I think of the word restraint, which may sound strange looking at this painting but if a child were doing it, or perhaps even if I were attempting, I probably wouldn't know when to stop. Maybe I would just keep going over colors. Um, might turn into much more of a blob. Uh, <laughs> but this painting has restraint in a certain way by allowing all the strokes and the colors uh, to live there. Okay, good. Um, and and would anyone else care to comment? Any a few, other? few comments in the chat um, about, first about where they would uh, hang the painting in their room. So Carol also said her living room, like Kathy did. Uh, Jean says her kitchen because she spends time there. Um, and then uh, comments about the course, uh, the colors, toward a force of colors, playful ap application of paint, unique use of color, uh, captures the vibrancy of an outdoor scene or a park being enjoyed. I'm curious about the, um, the choices of where to put it in your house. So Kathy, you said you'd put it so that you would see it right when you walk in your house. Um, but Carol, what was it about your living room? Why would you hang it there? Oh, Carol, you're muted. I live in an apartment and so my living room is my dominant room. I'm in it most often. And it, it's this kind of piece uh, that it, when I first saw it, I just started to smile. So mm. I, I like that feeling. It's friendly to me. Nice. Thanks for sharing. It sounds like most, <laughs> most people are, are wanting to put it in a room that it would be enjoyed a lot. So. And, and shared with others. That's a good point. If you put it in your bedroom, you might see it a lot, but your guests wouldn't. <laughs> I also liked some of the titles that were in the chat box. <laughs> oh, the Color Parade and Seasons and Reasons. I missed those. Thank you. Seasons and Reasons. Okay, good. Well, I think um, this artwork, oh, excuse me. I just have one more quick comment, if I may. When you see a picture like this, 
I'm always tempted to turn it around sideways, whirl it around, because unlike a true representational picture, you wouldn't have the building upside down or, so, you know. So if it could tur be turned in all different directions, I just wonder, or I would be tempted in my own home to do that. You know, every every couple months, just put it on this side, put it on that side. But I was just curious if we can turn it around with your technologically. Um, I don't think I can within this presentation. Um, but maybe towards the end, I can work on that. We can come back to it. Okay, good. Um, well, let's, um, let's look at the label. Um, so this is, the title is Dream Flowers 2 by Bill Scott, and it's an acrylic on the museum board. Um, and I think a lot of us, or a lot of you all, um, touched on the seasons and, um, and I think some of you kind of are not shocked by the title. Um, this artwork just relates to the theme because of its abstract aesthetic um, and also the artist's imaginative use of color and brushstrokes that convey playful, childlike, um, happy vibes. Um, and I think uh, many of your comments sort of echoed happy, fun, joyful, free, um, of being alive, living in the moment, um, felt energized. Um, and I saw a comment in the chat box that it was too, um, too energizing to hang in a bedroom <laughs> or, or something, something to that effect. So, um, but, um, it's, it, the artist is Bill Scott. He was born in 1956. He's a contemporary um, abstract painter and printmaker um, who lives and works in Philadelphia. Uh, Scott's artworks blur the lines between, um, or blur the boundaries between abstraction and representation, drawing both from nature and imagination the paintings are expressions, are not expressions of tangible realities, but rather ephemeral remembrances. An exploration of color and form stand at the core of Scott's work, where blocks of color, pattern, and lines are overlapped to form dynamic compositions that appear visually akin to collage. Um, the paintings rely on extremely vivid color palettes applied in fields of color that evoke um, both urban and pastoral scenes. In this sense, Scott's work continues the tradition of abstracted landscapes mastered by aestheticist artists such as Whistler. Uh, and the artist continually turns to flora and fauna for his subjects, stating that underbrush and floral subjects have long been recurrent, if not paramount to my painted imagery. Um, and the artist was also influenced by Renoir and Matisse. Um, so his works, um, he translates formal qualities from these masters works onto abstract and colorful canvases. So now let's move on um, to our last artwork, please. And again, um, we'll take about 15 seconds to look sort of top to bottom, left to right, and uh, corner to corner. Is this a three-dimensional object? It looks like it's a three-dimensional piece. Uh, yes, this is a sculpture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's going on in this artwork?
um, where is your eye drawn first? My eyes drawn to the two windows that aren't windows that are kind of boarded up almost like with popsicle sticks. And I kind of like the muted colors. I try to make it, I don't know the size of it, but it almost looks like it could be like a, a, a box, um, I don't know, you put cookies in or something. It, it just looks like, like a, a trinket, like a cute little box that I might want to put things in. Um. Okay, good. Um, so, um, so what, what more can we find about the um, materials? Um, I heard a comment about um, popsicle sticks. Um, yes, it looks like wood to me, um, almost a bird, bird uh, house kind of a feeling, uh, but definitely wood, and yet it feels very light, um, probably because of the colors. Okay, good. And Jean says she thinks it looks like a milk carton, decorated milk carton. Okay, good. Plus the way the colors are sort of feathered, if you will, like the, the blue, the browns, the oranges, the white, it, it nothing except for the bottom is, is solid. Everything else kind of has this distressed or like feathered look to it. Okay, so um, what would happen if you picked it up? Um, how would it, well, how would it feel? Um, and and how would, what would it weigh? Well, I think it's hollow, but I don't know the size of it. It appears to me to be like, there'd be nothing in it but empty space. So if it's small, I might be able to pick it up. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, Carol I think... Says Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kay. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I think it's lightweight. And when you picked it up, I'd be tempted to turn it over and look inside because I have a feeling the bottom is hollow, but I don't know that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Carol says in the chat she thinks it would uh, separate if you picked it up. The white portion seems like a platform and that maybe the building here would come apart from it. Carol, what makes, what do you see that makes you think that they're separate? Uh, they, they, because they just look like two different things. The bottom one just looks like it's a crate that's been turned upside down. And then the top looks like it's more carefully constructed piece. But the platform, it, there it was in the garage and he uses that to put this on top of kind of thing. So, and then the the lack of color on the bottom compared to the color, the different colors in there. It looks sort of chalky too, the top to me. Does anybody feel that? It looks got, kind of got a chalky look rather than painterly. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. I, I think the bottom was already there and he painted it and the top was what he or she designed. Okay. S Sally had made a comment about the, um, the lines up top, um, let, let me see, the energetic lines activate the surface. I'm curious what, Sally, wh what do you mean by activate the surface? It causes your eyes to kind of move around more, um, particularly on the um, brown because there's space behind the lines. Whereas on, on the top, the lines are straighter, um, they cross more, and it makes it a little more solid. But then they contrast nicely with the kind of red-orange there on the top. And the blue has more lines on it, starting to be um, more solid, and then lines, more lines on the shutter, kind of, the shutters. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Do we know if the other two sides are just replicated of what we're seeing or are they all totally different? 
I haven't seen this one in person. I haven't seen this one in person either. To me, it looks like an older child would have uh, created this if, if a child had done so instead of a, a younger child. It seems pretty well organized and lines seem parallel and um, as though time was taken to place things specifically. So what role does color play in the meaning of this artwork? Well, I'm also struck by the shutters um, and the fact that there's um, different color stripes on the uh, shutter that's on the left. And so it's quite, quite playful. Um, and it feels very summery almost to me because I think of windows or whatever you would call those shutters, but because of the, the wood being on the outside like that, for me, it feels like uh, it's something that you would close when you're closing up a, a summer place, for instance, to protect the, the window or the screen. I would, okay, wonder, I would wonder about the process of the construction, whether it was like built, assuming this is all like wood or sticks or things, and then painted and colored, or if each individual segment was colored first and then the whole thing constructed and adhered together. Okay, good. Which do you think it is, Laurel? Or anyone? I think it's probably colored first and then put together. Almost seems a little fragile to do that after. <laughs> Maybe it would start to come apart. So who do you imagine might live in this sculpture? It has a beachy feel to me. I think of, I saw this in real life, you know, if it were a real <laughs> building, I envision it being maybe near the beach, maybe in a tropical setting. It has the feeling of f being created from found materials, whatever was at hand and using whatever paint was available, you know, if it were a real building. I was going to say it looked like maybe a bird lived in it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the other side has a window and a perch. I think maybe it was either a lemonade stand or a rental place for equipment that might be contained inside at a beach environment. So, um, okay, good. So, so how does this artwork make you feel? Kind of continuing with all these sort of themes and comments we've just had, sort of playful, summer, beachy, tropical. Uh, how does this artwork make you feel? It makes me feel good and like I want to find the door and go in there and uh, open the windows and spend a little time. <laughs> okay, good. And how do you think this artwork would make a child feel? Almost like a dollhouse. I mean, I could see a child wanting to put action figures or dolls or toys inside. Okay, good. Uh, Jean says that she feels like there's conflict here. The windows are boarded up, but the colors are playful. So there's some kind of contrast going on, maybe, from the... Yes, I thought that too, Jean. I couldn't figure out why the windows were boarded up. And then when uh, someone started talking about beachy, you know, I got to thinking, well, maybe it's one of those stilt kind of houses and there's a hurricane coming. Uh, 
and they boarded it up. Or it's the off season, yeah. boarded up for the winter. So why do you think that this artwork is in a museum? Got us stumped on this one. <laughs> well, art is very subjective, and uh, what we're looking at is challenging. Um, just your, with your theme, challenging um, what is art and what makes um, it worthy of being in a museum. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, question, in a sense. It's an interesting piece because of the fact with the boarded up almost makes you feel lonely and desolate, but yet because of the way the colors and the construction of it um, makes you feel like playful or happy. So it is kind of an interesting conflicting piece. Sally says maybe it's in a museum because of how the artist put together a variety of elements. And Jean is um, referencing Cy Twombly, that maybe it looks like, or it reminds her, the scribbles remind her of uh, his work. So maybe it's, again, maybe it's an artist of uh, high reputation in the art world. I would also wonder how long it took to make. Like, was it something easy and quick, or, or did it really take a long time. It could also be part of a historical uh, representation of a person's artwork, uh, sort of tracing the evolution of their, their work over time. And we don't know why this is, but we understand from our reporting that uh, the president was supposed to lead a 1215 call on the COVID-19 and its effect on Okay, good. Well, um, this artwork um, has, is, has been complicated, um, but I think it relates to the theme because of the artist's use of primitive materials and colors that evoke playful, happy, childlike vibes. And I think um, um, we touched upon that in the, the conversation um, with uh, you all commented on the materials, kind of the found wood and popsicle sticks and the color and um, just sort of the whimsical kind of lines and, and patterns. Um, so now let's look at the label, please. Uh, this is entitled Hillside Shack. Um, and it's the artist is um, Beverly Buchanan. It's an acrylic and oil pastel on foam board in wood. Um, and and this, the, relating back to the theme, um, the scholar Janet T. Marquette argues that the artist Beverly Buchanan treats shacks not as documentary elements but as images of endurance and personal history, often using bright colors and a style of childlike simplicity that work, the works evoke the warmth and happiness that can be found even in the meanest dwelling, representing the faith and caring that is not reserved for the privileged classes. Um, and again, the artist Beverly Buchanan, she was born in 1940 and she passed away in uh, 2015. She's an African-American artist whose works include painting, sculpture, uh, video, and land art. She's noted for her exploration of Southern vernacular architecture through her art. Um, Vernacular architecture is architecture characterized by the use of local materials and knowledge 
usually without supervision of um, professional architects. Um, and the artist uh, in 1962, she graduated from Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, a historically black women's college with a Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology. She went on to attend Columbia University where she received a master's degree in parasitology in 1968 and a master's degree in public health in 1969. While working uh, in New Jersey, she applied to medical school and although she was accepted, she decided not to go due to her desire to dedicate more time to her art. Um, she is best known for her later career sculptures of shacks, some inspired by the actual homes of the rural poor, others invented. As a child, she accompanied her father, who was the dean of the School of Agriculture a South Carolina, at South Carolina State College, and he ventured out to meet the farmers and sharecroppers in the cotton belt. And so these shack sculptures are deeply tied to her upbringing. Buchanan said of her work, my work is a logical progression of my early interest in textures and surfaces and walls. The early walls were lonely, freestanding, fragmented things. Uh, when I lived in New York, I was looking for things that were demolished. That gave them character. I like to imagine who might have lived in the apartment and whose home it might have been. Each family that moved in repainted the walls their color. When a building is torn down, the various layers of color are exposed. It's almost surgical like looking through a microscope and looking at different layers of tissue and media. Um, so thank you all very much. I enjoyed our conversation that we shared today. Thank you for your contributions to the tour. Um, and I'm so pleased you joined me. Uh, and as always, I look forward to seeing you at the museum. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And thank, thank you, you everyone for being here and for thank participating you. in our conversation. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next week. We have um, Susan Oliver, Touring Docent, and her theme for Slow Art Friday is Talking Animals. So we okay. hope you enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>